Good evening. My name is Dr. Verna Marina Errett, and I would like to welcome you to this panel presentation, Is This a Crisis? Understanding and Responding to the Drug-Resistant Bacteria Problem, hosted by the Evelyn Lincoln Institute for Ethics and Society. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I am the director of the Institute, but I'll give you just a quick history about the Institute itself. Elias was established in the fall of 2008 through a generous grant from Emily and John Costigan. Emily Costigan is a 1964 graduate of Mercyhurst College, and the Institute is named in honor of her mother, Evelyn Lincoln Jacobson, uh, I'm sorry, Evelyn Jacobson Lincoln, who graduated from Mercyhurst in 1930 and is pictured here. The first co-directors of Elias were Dr. Daniel McPhee in Religious Studies and Dr. Kevin Sullivan in Philosophy. They developed the Distinguished Speaker Series and Roundtables for focusing on three primary areas, socially responsible business practices, science and emerging technologies, ecology and sustainability. While the Institute has broadened its scope, these three areas remain at the heart of the Institute's work. So before I introduce tonight's panelists, I'd like to thank the event staff and the marketing department for all of their assistance in putting together tonight's program. I would also like to thank Mercyhurst University, President Victor, Provost Roberts, Dean Riley Brown of the Hafenmeyer College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and Dean Elnitsky of the Zern College of Natural and Health Sciences for their support of the Institute. And now just a little bit of background on our panelists. Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Amy Danowitz, who is Associate Professor of Chemistry and Interim Chair of the Department of Chemistry. Her research interests include finding small molecule modulators of bacterial quorum sensoring. sensing. I almost got that right. Ongoing work in her lab includes synthesizing small molecules that share structural similarities with the native quorum sensing molecules and testing them for their ability to modulate quorum sensing in vibrio fissuri. Some of her recent work can be found in the International Journal of Ethics Education and the Journal of the Pennsylvania Ac Academy of Science. Our second speaker tonight will be Dr. Lucy Theroux, who is Assistant Professor of Public Health. She has over 15 years of epidemiology experience and has taught public health at both Stanford University and Toro University before coming to Mercyhurst. She is also an occasional consultant for UNICEF and the World Health Organization. And our final speaker tonight, Dr. Randy Clemens, is Professor of Political Science and the Associate Dean of the Ridge College of Intelligence Studies and Applied Sciences. He teaches and researches in both international relations and public policy. Dr. Clemens' recent research has appeared in the Journal of Public Administration, Foreign Policy Analysis, World Medical and Health Policy, Risks, Hazards and Crisis in Public Policy, and Electronic Hallway. So I will be moderating tonight's panel, and we'll begin with some brief remarks from each of our panelists to set the foundation of our discussion. I'll then ask the panelists a series of prearranged questions to start the discussion, and finally we'll open up the panel to questions and comments from the audience. So now I will turn it over to our panelists. All right, hi everybody. Um, thanks for coming tonight. So I just wanted to start off with a couple of brief slides introducing why antibiotic resistance is something that we should be concerned about and something that you should care about going forward. If you've been paying attention to the popular press media in the past several years, you may have noticed this idea of antibiotic resistance cropping up in some news headlines. We will get reports every so often from the Center for Disease Control or from the World Health Organization basically sending up a red flag that antibiotic resistance is something that we should start being pretty concerned about. In addition to these kind of popular press media, there are also studies that are coming out from the CDC and the WHO that is indicating that antibiotic resistance is already a problem in the United States and worldwide. So we can see from the Center for Disease Control that approximately two million people become infected with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics each year. And we can also see that globally we are starting to see fatalities due to these multi-resistant bacteria. Hopefully, um, efforts moving forward will be able to address these concerns. However, right now, this is a large area of emerging concern that has a pretty big unmet research need. 
To give you an idea of how quickly bacteria can evolve antibiotic resistance, I wanted to play a video. This video actually documents an experiment that came out of Harvard. And what they're going to show you is just how rapidly and how thoroughly bacteria can evolve almost complete resistance to an antibiotic. So what we ended up building was basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, of course, is thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. Okay, so 11 days. If this was a hand mic, I could almost drop it. Um, that's terrifying, right? That we can go from completely susceptible to resistant at a thousand fold. And bacteria are really, really good at evolving resistance to antibiotics, mainly because there's a huge evolutionary pressure to do so, adapt or literally die. And bacteria have a lot of different ways that they can share their adaptations. Bacteria, as we know, uh, produce as reproduce asexually, but that doesn't mean that they can't share their modifications that they get or that they evolve. One way that bacteria can share their modification is they can actually release naked DNA into their surroundings, and then those DNA molecules can be taken up by another bacteria. This would be the process of um, just kind of a way to share that DNA. The DNA can be released, or it can be released by a cell getting killed for a different reason. Another way that bacteria can share information is they can create small circular loops of DNA called plasmids, Bacteria can actually conjugate with another bacterium. On that far picture, the one in the middle, we can see that it's sort of like a tunnel being formed from one cell to another cell. The plasmid that could carry a resistance gene could be passed through that tunnel to now make a previously susceptible bacterium now resistant. So we have a lot of mechanisms for these bacteria to spread these resistance genes. So this is going to be an ongoing problem and something that I think our public health and our political science um, faculty can help us address societally. There are a lot of different ways that antibiotic resistance can spread. So if you get a resistant bacteria, how do you spread that around? One way is with direct human contact. If you come into contact with somebody who has a resistant infection, they could pass that infection on to you. Another way is through a mediator person, so maybe a carrier, or maybe coming into contact with a contaminated surface. And these are ways that a lot of hospital infections can tend to spread. We also have the ability to travel, so bacteria can spread at the speed of air travel. Additionally, we have a lot of antibiotics being used in our livestock. If an antibiotic-resistant bacterium evolves within the livestock, it can then be passed on to you in terms of your food if you are going to eat that animal. 
if that animal's manure is released into the water supply or sprayed directly onto crops as a form of fertilizer, that antibiotic resistant bacteria can also be passed along that way too. And we've seen recently that there have been just normal um, bacteria outbreaks that have been caused by this animal to vegetable pathway. So as scientists, we have kind of a difficult task here. How can we overcome this evolutionary drive from these bacteria to try to make antibiotics? Most of our traditional antibiotics have been targeted against pathways that are unique to bacteria. And this is why you can take an antibiotic orally. These antibiotics are going to be targeted against something unique to the bacterial cell that your cells do not possess. For example, we've got penicillin, which is going to be the structure on your left. Penicillin targets bacterial cell wall synthesis. Our cells don't have cell walls. So that's why we can take penicillin and not have our cells be damaged as well. We have other antibiotics that are targeted against other specific bacterial properties. Bacteria and humans produce proteins in different ways. We also produce nucleic acids in different ways. And we have different metabolites. So those are all pathways in bacteria that have been targeted. However, most of those pathways have developed pretty good resistance mechanisms. So even if we come up with a new drug that's not penicillin, but is still targeting the cell wall synthesis, it's very likely that the bacteria will already be or will very rapidly become resistant. Another thing that is very difficult in drug development is that drug development is a very, very lengthy process, and there are a lot of areas in drug development where a drug or a drug candidate could fail. So if you imagine trying to come up with a new drug, we can kind of think of this as a funnel. And I would say that this funnel is a little bit wide just because we had to fit the text in. It should be much bigger at the top and go much narrower at the bottom. So at the top of this funnel, we have all possible drug candidates. And we're just now going to talk about our traditional small molecule drugs. But you can imagine any small molecule out there, there are tens of millions and millions and millions of them. And even if we're just looking at drug-like candidates, so those of you who took OCHEM 1 or Lipinski's Rules of Five, that's still a huge number. So we have to narrow that down. We would start by doing some in vitro screens, testing to see which of these drug candidates can even act as antibiotics. And then we start going into our animal models. So which of these drug candidates that can act as antibiotics, are also able to work in an animal system without killing that animal, because we need to look for toxicity studies as well. Then we need to go through our FDA clinical process, so we have to look for toxicity in humans, and then efficacy, then efficacy on an even larger number of people before the molecule can even be considered to be approved. And then we still do post-approval monitoring to make sure that no adverse effects are coming out once the molecule hits the general population. Typically, we can imagine probably starting off with maybe 10,000 to 100,000 initial drug candidates and whittling that down to one drug. So clearly, this is not something that we're going to be able to do in the 11 days that it will take the bacteria to develop resistance. This is a really lengthy process and something that's usually taking on the order of eh, years seven to 10 years, maybe more, depending on exactly how difficult it is to go through all of these different processes. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. We can't move as quickly as bacteria, so we need to use all the tricks in all of our playbooks. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm going to be talking about multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, so overall, what I'm going to uh, look through uh, this evening is to discuss multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and then provide a basic overview of tuberculosis, including its causes, the symptoms, transmission, drug resistance, and the prevention of drug resistance. And then most important, uh, the use of the BCG vaccine in the developing world um, to, prevent multi uh, to prevent tuberculosis. So, 
So I'm going to start with a, a, a brief uh, video uh, from, sorry about that. I'm going to start with a brief video from the uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control to show you how TB is transmitted from uh, one person to the other. Tuberculosis, also known as TB, is spread through the air from one person to another. When someone with pulmonary TB disease coughs, TB bacteria are expelled into the air in tiny water droplets. These droplets can remain floating in the air for several hours making it possible for someone nearby to inhale them. Once a person has breathed in droplets that contain TB bacteria, they travel down the trachea and enter the lungs, where they collect in the alveolar sacs. Once in the alveolar sacs, the bacteria begin to multiply. The body's immune system starts working and macrophages begin to surround the bacteria. A granuloma is formed to keep the bacteria from spreading. The TB bacteria remain in the lungs, but the body is protected from disease by the granuloma. In 8 to 10 weeks, the person will most likely test positive for latent TB infection. The progression from latent TB infection to TB disease occurs when the granuloma break open and the TB bacteria multiply. Then the person becomes sick with TB disease and may be infectious. This progression can occur immediately after infection, many years later, or not at all. When the TB escapes from the granuloma and begins destroying a person's lungs, it's called pulmonary TB. TB bacteria can also enter the bloodstream and travel to other parts of the body, causing extra pulmonary TB. So what's the epidemiology of TB? Every year, there are an estimated 10 million people who are um, infected with tuberculosis worldwide. And in 2017, 1.6 million people died of tuberculosis. And the worst thing about it is that um, some people who have TB are not diagnosed as having the illness. And so that means that there are a lot of people who are living with tuberculosis who can, um, tra who, who can transmit the disease to others um, since they are not receiving any treatment. So tuberculosis does not have any symptoms during the latent stage, but during its active stage, patients will experience cough, fever, and other symptoms. And generally, as you saw in the video, TB can affect the lungs, but it can also affect other parts of the body. So how do we diagnose TB? TB is uh, generally tested using a skin test. And um, in that test, an extract of the bacterium is injected inside the forearm. Um, and then that site is investigated two to three days later. And if there is a bump um, at that site within two or three days at the site of the injection, then TB is considered to be present. Um, but there are other tests that can be used to test for the presence of TB. So how can TB be prevented um, using vaccination? Um, in the developing world, children are often injected with bacille calmet gary vaccination to vaccinate them against TB, especially since TB is common in the developing world. Um, but this uh, vaccine is not effective in adults, and actually if uh, uh, um, adults have been injected with BCG, they can get adverse reactions uh, during uh, the, the tuberculosis uh, skin test. And so in the United States, the CDC recommends um, uh, the vaccination for only a select group of people, such as children who are exposed to TB from their parents. Um, those are the populations, for example, that um, are recommended to receive uh, uh, BCG vaccination. So why is BCG vaccination not generally used in the United States? Um, generally, there is a low risk of TB um, in this country. And also, the vaccine does not seem to be effective for adults uh, with TB. Um, and also, it can interfere with the results of the, of the TB skin test. <laughs> 
So treatment of uh, TB. Antibiotics are prescribed for the treatment of TB. And generally, uh, isoniazid is recommended daily for nine months. Um, and that's the most common therapy uh, for latent TB. Another uh, treatment is rifampin, which is prescribed every day for four months, um, especially if a patient has uh, contraindications to isoniazid. Um, the other uh, therapy can be isoniazid and rifampin um, weekly for three months. So multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, this is a tuberculosis that's resistant to treatment using isoniazid and rifampin. And these are the two most potent uh, TB drugs that are used to treat tuberculosis. So why does multi-drug resistant TB develop? Well, as you can see, standard TB treatment requires many months of drugs. And these drugs have side effects, uh, such as nausea and vomiting, and also the duration, the number of months that patients need to take these drugs can make some people abandon um, their treatment. And so when people have incomplete treatment, that can lead to drug resistance. And drug resistance is generally considered when TB bacteria resist one or more uh, of TB drugs. So it's really important to complete treatment fully for patients who have TB. Um, and even when there are no symptoms, when patients believe that they are healed, um, it is important for them to continue receiving uh, treatment for, uh, for t tuberculosis to avoid developing multi-drug uh, resistant TB. So what happens is that when um, the antibiotics do not kill all of the bacteria, um, because the treatment has not been completed, um, those bacteria that, uh, that, that, that survive end up developing resistance um, to that antibiotic. And uh, one of the challenges in treating uh, multi-drug resistance tuberculosis is that it requires very specific drugs, and these are limited or often they are not readily available. So overall, um, in the United States, the proportion of drug resistance TB cases has remained the same for over 20 years. And the most common type of resistance that has been seen is isoniazid uh, resistance. Um, in 2017, for example, according to the CDC, there were 608 cases of um, isoniazid resistance. Another type of drug resistance that can de develop is extensively resistant uh, is extensively drug resistance tuberculosis. And this is TB that is resistant to isoniazid, rifampin, and at least uh, three of the second line anti-TB drugs. Um, in 2017, according to the CDC, there were two cases of extensively drug resistance tuberculosis. So these are my references. The CDC is a really good source of information for uh, uh, TB, and as well the World Health Organization and the uh, Global Fund are really good sources of information. Good evening, I want to thank Dr. Eret for organizing the panel as well as the audience for coming. Uh, apologize for my voice, I'm fighting off a cold. I taught a class earlier this afternoon, so uh, hopefully it'll hold on a little. In 2014, I published a co-authored article that I'm going to lean on heavily tonight uh, in a journal called Risk, Hazards, and Crisis in Public Policy. It's a journal that studies how societies measure and understand risk and how risks become crises. People tend to associate crises with really dramatic and tragic events, but policy crises are not always acute, not always immediate, not always dramatic, and not always visible. 9-11 was. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio being on fire was pretty dramatic. Yet even those sorts of crises don't always evoke the sort of change that people expect from the government. And for slower developing, less visible, less dramatic solutions, even overwhelming scientific evidence, or an overwhelming consensus that there's a problem or that it's going to cause a problem, 
does not guarantee that government will act in a broad and fast manner. The scientific evidence regarding climate change shouts crisis, and yet government actions to address it remain disjointed, incremental, missing, and sometimes even policies that are going to make it worse. It's common to call the drug-resistant bacteria a crisis. A few weeks ago, I did an advanced Google search of antibiotic-resistant crisis, limited it to the last four years. All those words had to appear, and I found over 3,000 articles. And the facts you heard from my colleagues tonight suggest that this is a crisis, maybe even terrifying. Crisis suggests the need for substantial policy change, but such change doesn't regularly occur. So will the problem be addressed? What really is then a policy crisis? A couple of authors named Norstadt and Weibel explain that crisis denotes periods of disorder, along with widespread questioning or discrediting of established policies, practices, and institutions. The paper I co-authored talked about the discrediting of establishing policies, practices, and institutions through the development of new policy narratives. Policy narratives are simply policy stories comprised of a structure that has a plot and characters and a moral and a recommended policy solution to a perceived problem. An example I thought might lend some insight into our topic tonight is the history of tobacco policy, which did not change, I will point out, until long after science had established it as the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. One key aspect of smoking policy was that there had a narrative that protected the status quo. That narrative pro projected tobacco smoking as benign and as an individual choice, therefore not an area that the government should be able to regulate. The villain in their story was not tobacco companies. No, no. The villain there was uh, the do-gooder regulators who wanted to infringe on the rights of cigarette smokers, on the rights of tobacco farmers, on the rights of cigarette companies. David Kessler wrote a wonderful book uh, about the Food and Drug Administration and smoking. And in it, he documents that when issues were raised about tobacco, the debate ended up not being about public health, not being even really about smoking itself, often not even just about an individual's right to choose, they turned those issues around. It was about protecting farmers. It was about social engineering. It was about fascism. It was about uh, a war on the South. It was about capitalism. So initially then, the story's frame wasn't about the hazards of smoking, but about free enterprise and agriculture and individual rights. The policy change happened when the opponents of smoking were able to construct a new policy reality by creating a new policy narrative. One important element of that was the development of the non-smokers' rights movement that eventually led to the banning of smoking on airplanes and then in public buildings later. There was a U.S. Surgeon General report that found that smoke might harm non-smokers. There was a New Jersey Superior Court case that concluded that secondhand smoke led to all sorts of health problems. Both of those things created new victims, individuals who didn't smoke. Later, when we discovered that tobacco companies and cigarette companies were long aware that tobacco was addictive, those who supported regulation were more able to effectively portray those companies as villains. They also created this new expanded regulatory story wherein cigarette smokers who before, remember, were individually responsible for their choice were now not smoking of their own volition, but innocent victims who had become addicted. Tobacco's opponents also focused on the company's targeting of youth. Crucially, they undercut that individual choice freedom argument. Let me read you a quote from then FDA Commissioner Kessler about it. Of course, we all want freedom for our children, but not the freedom to make irreversible decisions in childhood that result in devastating health consequences. Addiction is freedom denied. We owe it to our children to help them enter childhood free from addiction. Our children are entitled to a lifetime of choices, not a lifelong addiction. So thus, with an alternative story constructed and accepted that comprised a whole new set of villains and victims and heroes, tobacco policy changed. While the scientific evidence about the harmful effects of tobacco was important, such evidence was necessary but not sufficient. Instead, for the problem to become a crisis that evoked policy change, a new policy narrative had to be constructed. 
To head towards a conclusion tonight, I want to lay out three policy lessons related to tonight's topic that are drawn partially from the history of smoking policy and then sum up. One, the advocates of any policy change to address this issue must craft a new narrative that is simple and clear and powerful, one that changes and controls the definition, the framing of the issue. The United States has a very individualistic culture, and in the United States, healthcare has been framed much more as an individual issue than a public health issue. And people feel it's their right to demand antibiotics when they're ill. Anyone who tries to take away their right to demand that is the enemy, including the government. In terms of a policy narrative, then, they need to construct a story with a villain who's not the individual who's choosing, and not their doctor, but instead, for example, Big Pharma and politicians who are in bed with them, preventing the government from doing their job and protecting us. That story will be more effective than laying out a bunch of facts about how bacteria becomes, you know, resistant. Two, using the old adage that a problem without a solution isn't a problem, many scholars contend that a policy crisis is constructed only when there are society-based solutions which are socially acceptable. To overcome this hurdle, the advocates need likely construct a story of market failure um, and come up with some acceptable solutions. Let me explain what I mean. Policy narratives are, contain a plot or storyline. A plot and a policy story lead you to a logical conclusion that sets up a solution. A pro-regulatory policy story, for example, might revolve around the presentation of facts about the drug-resistant bacteria epidemic but would then present a causal theory that the dangerous consequences are not natural and inevitable, but rather being caused by big pharma bribing doctors with gifts and trips. Such a policy store online could also suggest free market failure, because free market depends on valuable knowledge that consumers have. Here that you could argue consumers don't have that knowledge about the issue because they've been brainwashed by a steady diet of corporate marketing. In response, of course, those who oppose regulation might invoke a nanny story, right? Arguing that individual freedom in our democratic and capitalist society is increasingly under attack, again, by those do-gooders. And thus, the narrative battle, tug-of-war, is going to revolve around beliefs about whether there's market failure or not, and therefore regulation is necessary, or whether we're simply impinging on individual freedom unnecessarily. In other words, the debate is not about the fundamental facts, it's not about the science. Third, public policy literature stresses the importance of focusing events. Focusing events are powerful. They can bring immediate attention to a policy problem, as did, sadly, the Parkland, Parkland school shootings a little over a year ago on Valentine's Day. While many studies detail the problem of drug-resistant bacteria, it might be difficult to find a single, naturally occurring, unifying focusing event that is so dramatic and scary that it's capable of catapulting the issue to widespread placement on policy agendas. Significantly, though, focusing events do not just objectively occur in the political system. Policy entrepreneurs can socially construct them and convince the public of the need for specific solutions. Focusing, focusing events are normally most effective when they put forward a human face representing innocent victims or a fallen hero. That is, and there's research to back this up, individuals connect better with identifiable victims than with statistical aggregations. We feel somewhat worse about five individual children dying than a million people dying. While the consequences of inaction are troubling, it's somewhat difficult for me to think of a realistic, dramatic, acute focusing event that would demand an immediate change in antibiotic resistance policy. Therefore, in addition to defining a villain, detailing acceptable solutions, and constructing a market failure narrative, getting on the formal policy agenda will likely require policy entrepreneurs creating a focusing event with a human face. In sum, not to leave you on a bad note, but I fear that the status quo may win the day. Change, which requires breaking up an established policy monopoly, is always an uphill battle. It's essential then that the dedicated scientists and policy analysts and public health professionals working to make a difference understand that success does not depend primarily on scientific facts, but on telling a story that defines the drug-resistant bacteria problem as a crisis, 
one with cost-effective and culturally acceptable solutions. Then, perhaps, a story of innocent victims and of calculating, obfuscating villains who need reined in will eventually win out. But some issues do not easily lend themselves to effective construction of a narrative of policy crisis that will evoke change. Drug-resistant bacteria, unfortunately, may be an example of a problem that is resistant to that. Thank you. So we've laid out the basic situation for you and the science, the public health implications and the policy implications for drug-resistant bacteria. What I'd like to do first is give the panelists a moment if you have specific questions for each other before we turn to some formal questions. There's a All right, ready for formal questions. So, the first question that we have then, and this will allow our panelists to expand a little on what they've already presented, is there a way to streamline the drug discovery process? So I guess I'll start off with that one. Can everybody hear me on the mic? Are we good? Okay, cool. There are a couple of ideas that are floating around for streamlining the drug discovery process. One of the ideas is getting better model systems. If you remember from my funnel, we had to get from something that was very, very broad, which is pretty much all of the possible drug candidates, to getting something that is likely to even work as an antibiotic. One way that we can kind of streamline this process that a lot of scientists are working on is coming up with a model system that could work better. And one model system that we're really looking at that would be faster and more cost effective is something that you, about half of you are holding in your labs right now. So we're looking to do a lot of initial screening on a computer program, come up with a reasonable model for bacteria, and then run a computer simulation with a whole bunch of those potential drug candidates. This would really cut down on the design time of actually synthesizing or obtaining those drug candidates and then having to test them. Another area that's being looked at is really streamlining the FDA approval process, especially for these antibiotics that are in really big demand right now. And to get that done, yep. <laughs> again, right, you need to tell an effective story of how scary this is, right? Um, so take the picture of the table in the 11 days, the numbers on the millions of people affected, and attach it to the face of some innocent woman. Hate to be simple. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Okay, so given that, if we look more speci specifically at tuberculosis, is the BCG vaccine used differently in the United States than it is in the developing world? Yes, so in the United States, the BCG vaccine is contraindicated as, uh, unless it's for very uh, specific populations. For example, children whose parents have TB or who are exposed to TB within their own um, households. Um, or children who are born to um, immigrant uh, parents who have been exposed to TB. Um, so the, in the United States, the uh, BCG vaccine is not of the news. Or even um, another population for whom the BCG vaccine is uh, used in the United States is healthcare workers who might be exposed um, to tuberculosis. But in general, um, the vaccine is not recommended um, as it is in the developing world. Now, in the developing world, the situation is different. Um, you know, children get exposed to TB very early on in the developing world. So it's recommended um, that most children um, at birth be uh, injected with the BCG vaccine. And I think that that helps prevent a lot of TB cases in the developing world. So if we can follow up on that then, why is drug-resistant tuberculosis more common in the developing world? I think a number of reasons why uh, multi-drug resistant TB is more common in the developing world. 
Um, firstly, as you saw, um, uh, the course of TB treatment takes months. Um, it takes four months for certain uh, types of treatment regimens, sometimes nine months. Um, and in the developing world, it's difficult to keep um, to keep tabs on patients for that amount of time. You know, in nine months, a lot can happen. Patients will migrate from one place to another um, and uh, lose contact with the clinics that uh, where they have been receiving treatment. Um, other reasons, the side effects of the drugs, um, they might lead patients to discontinue treatment. Um, and so in the developing world, one of the strategies that's used is DOTS, uh, directly observed uh, therapy. So patients uh, get directly observed by their healthcare workers um, when they're receiving um, TB treatment. So that helps reduce that multi-drug resistant tuberculosis a little bit. Um, but one of the other problems is that HIV and AIDS often co-occurs with uh, tuberculosis. Um, so a lot of patients are receiving not only treatment for HIV and AIDS, but they're also receiving treatment for tuberculosis. So that's a heavy drug regimen. Um, and so patients find it easy to discontinue uh, treatment and not be compliant uh, to treatment. So that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, multi-drug resistant TB is more common um, in the developing world. And then also just the prevalence. You know, there are so many cases of TB in the first place in the developing world that you will also uh, uh, consequently see a larger number of uh, multi-drug resistant TB cases in the developing world, especially uh, and especially in Africa and uh, parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, there are very many cases of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So I want to take a moment, we have several planned questions that will help unpack some of these ideas, but I want to take a moment and see are there questions from the audience before we go further. Unfortunately, I don't know of any drug uh, therapy that takes less than four months. Um, so it's still, you know, it would be great if there were drugs in development that could take a shorter time. Um, it would be great if we could reduce the treatment time. Um, and especially that would make uh, patients more compliant. Um, the only problem is that, you know, as TB is not necessarily an issue in resource-rich countries, there isn't a lot of money out there for TB research, um, for drugs against TB. It's mostly a problem in the developing world where most of the world's poorest people live. Um, so it's not something that's attracting a lot of attention. Um, 
But there is a new organization, the Global Fund for Malaria, TB, and HIV, um, that is doing some work related to tuberculosis. Um, and so hopefully over the coming years, I am hopeful, I really am. I really hope that as we go along, we will get new drugs that are more effective um, and also that require shorter treatment regimens and also that have fewer side effects. Um, you know, you can imagine also that most of the people who get tuberculosis in the developing world do not know how to read or write. Um, so giving them drugs that have a compli uh, complicated uh, regimen makes it difficult for them to be compliant. Um, so I'm hopeful that, you know, the Global Fund will do more um, to reduce TB and reduce multi-drug resistant TB in the developing world. Other questions from the audience? Okay, so to tie back into something Dr. Clement said here, given that this is both a global and a domestic problem, what is the most appropriate way, you think, to approach working on solutions? I think money, I think money is important. You know, the more resources that we can pour into TB um, research, um, researching newer drugs that are more effective, um, the better it is. Um, and then secondly, advocacy. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, way back when HIV drugs were not uh, commonly available or um, reasonably priced for patients with HIV and AIDS in the developing world, um, it, was, it was really difficult for them to get HIV treatment, but there was a lot of advocacy. Um, you know, people um, lobbied, um, they got treatments at cheaper prices in the developing world, and that also helped for the developed world. Um, sometimes there are trickle-down uh, innovations, and other times there are trickle-up innovations. Um, so that advocacy in the developing world helped not only patients, developed world, but also in the developing world, um, to get access to HIV treatment. Now the problem with tuberculosis is that these are poor populations, you know, they are not as well organized as patients with HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, patients with HIV and AIDS had great lobbies, they were able to lobby for better medication, less stigma, um, but patients with tuberculosis are probably not as well organized as patients with TB. Um, so yeah, so we need advocacy and we need more money uh, to lobby for TB treatment. First, going back to your point earlier, I know I'm not, I haven't checked the number in the last year or two, but a couple of years ago there was more money being spent on research and development of male pattern baldness and malaria, <laughs> right? And, and those problems aren't equal, but the question is where are they a problem, right? Um, while drug approval happens in the United States at the federal level. Uh, we are a federalist uh, system, uh, so you can play the game at multiple levels. You can play it at the federal level, you can play it at the state level, you can play it at local levels. And if you look at the measles outbreaks happening, for example, in Washington State uh, and other places around the country, that's because of state-specific programs. Like in Washington State, they made it really easy for people to get out of vaccines, uh, not just because of like religious beliefs, but philosophical differences, right? And so they're, they're right now in the process of trying to change that sort of policy. Uh, so you have to play this game like a three-dimensional chess uh, at the national level as well as on the international stage. <laughs> okay, so then let me take it back to the science. If we develop new antibiotics, won't no, new resistance just occur? Yes, but um, if we are going the traditional route where we are putting this intense evolutionary pressure on the bacteria to literally adapt or die, going with our traditional small molecule therapeutics, yes, the bacteria are going to develop resistance. 
One thing to keep in mind, though, is that the video that we saw was under a very lab-controlled condition. Penicillin has been around for almost 100 years, and there are still bacteria out there that are susceptible to penicillin. So it's not that the idea that as soon as a single resistant bacterium emerges, we will have complete resistance in 11 days. It takes much longer for the resistance to spread. Another way that scientists are looking at targeting this is to try and target other pathways that maybe don't have as strong as an evolutionary advantage to overcome. For example, my research is looking at bacterial quorum sensing. That's how bacteria can communicate with one another. When bacteria can communicate, then they'll turn on a lot of their virulence pathways and become much more dangerous to human health. There has been initial studies, this is a pretty new field so we don't have definitive data, but initial studies have indicated that if you can make it so that the bacteria don't communicate with each other, it is actually an evolutionary disadvantage for them to mutate around that. So if we could come up with a way to stop the bacteria from communicating, we may be able to prevent the bacteria from producing these virulence factors and then the bacteria really has no reason to try and evolve around our inhibition. We're also looking at some of those biologics, so like the bacteriophage, with the hopes that maybe we can get nature to fight nature, and then we could get something that's gonna be targeting the bacteria that may also be able to adapt and change on its own. So Dr. Thayer, you've already answered this to some extent with the discussion of funding and uh, organization, but if you could get one single resource to help with discovering new antibiotics or other forms of treatment of these uh, drug-resistant bacteria, what would it be? I think funding and research, um, continuing to do research um, to find new drugs um, that are more effective. And obviously that will require funding. I would definitely agree with funding. Um, drug companies don't necessarily find it to be profitable to develop an antibiotic. How many of you have been on an antibiotic at some point in your life? So you know that you're only on it, um, in most cases, not in the case of, of TV, but in most cases you're on it for a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, or maybe you just get a shot. For all of the billions of dollars that it costs to develop an antibiotic, the drug companies are not going to be able to recoup their investment if you're just taking the antibiotic for a week or two. So getting funding from private sources, from governmental sources, incentives for these drug companies to put their considerable resources behind developing new forms of antibiotics, that would really be a shot in the arm in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just add that research and development money uh, spent by government has really misunderstood uh, what crucial role it's played in so many things we take for granted in our life today. And it's because they're solving market failure, right? It's not in the interest of the companies to develop those drugs because they're not going to make enough so there's a little work we've got to concern. So let me ask a slightly different and, and off-script question. Given the challenge of creating a narrative that would show this drug resistance to be a crisis, what would the scientists need in order to create that narrative? Well, sadly, the easiest answer is a problem that got very serious very fast, where a lot of people died or were significantly harmed. Right? That's the easiest answer. Um, so you know, let's hope that's not it. Uh, uh, along with that, I think though they, they they need to understand again how the policy process really works, uh, so that they can craft it, so that they can figure out which evidence uh, and how best to craft that story. Short of that, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Uh, your science, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, I think that because TB treatment takes so many months, it is really possible to organize the patient 
you know, organize them into coalitions so that they can speak up for themselves um, and so that they can become advocates for their treatment. Um, we saw that happen with HIV and AIDS. You know, that's treatment that takes years um, and patients were able to organize themselves into coalitions and uh, advocacy groups. So I think having the TB patients be able to speak up for themselves, that would help a lot in terms of creating a narrative. I think better science education for the general public could go a really long way. I don't imagine that too many people outside of really intense science circles really understand exactly how difficult it is to do drug development and drug discovery. I think also better trust in science just in general. Dr. Clemens was talking about the measles outbreaks because of anti-vaxxers. So there, there is this sort of eroding public trust and public understanding in science. I think if we could kind of work to bridge those gaps, that would go an awful long way. I think also getting people to care about something that is not an in-your-face crisis, while there are so many in-your-face crises right now, is quite difficult. But I think if we're waiting to the point where there is that huge dramatic event, we still have that five to 10 year lag period in the R&D before we're getting someplace where we can start to address that. So getting people to understand that this is coming down the pipeline and we need to start addressing it now before it is a real tremendous crisis, that's something else that I think um, scientists could help with or could need. Other questions from the audience? So with the uh, like patient non-appearance, when you mentioned the uh, direct observation therapy, um, considering that the length of time that like, tuberculosis needs to be treated and where people think, oh, I'm, I'm healed, now I'm not showing symptoms, they stop, and then now they have drug multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, how, what, have you, you know, any methods that are good to keep people on the treatment for the full length? Um. I think, you know, in the developing world, directly observed therapy has been a really good initiative. Um, but again, that requires resources. You need a healthcare worker who can go to the villages um, and observe people taking the medication. Um, and that's expensive. It's expensive. So we need new ways of keeping uh, patients compliant. Um, like I said, um, getting patients into coalitions or advocacy groups, um, getting them into peer support groups um, so that you know that you need to continue with your treatment even when you're starting to feel better. Um, I think that that's a mistake that we make in the developing world and also here in the developed world. You know, as soon as you start feeling better, then you're no longer taking your antibiotics. Um, and patients in the developing world are not different. Um, as soon as they start feeling better, they stop um, taking their medication. So directly observe therapy, um, a treatment, um, but like I said, it's really expensive, so we need new strategies. I think, for example, peer support groups would be a really good way of ensuring that patients are compliant to treatment. Other questions from the audience? Has it ever been observed or um, is it possible for bacteria to become resistant even with the fulfillment of treatment? Come again, sir. Oh, sorry. Is it possible for bacteria to become resistant even with the fulfillment of treatment? I haven't heard of that. Um, the question is whether it's possible for bacteria to become resistant if treatment has been fully completed, and I haven't heard of that. Generally, patients are better off completing their treatment. Other questions? 
So I don't know that there's a definitive answer or a definitive set of experiments that has addressed that, but that would absolutely be a concern. There is a lot of crosstalk with those form sensing molecules. It's, it's really starting to emerge that there's crosstalk there, you know, even between our cells. When we're looking at uh, soil bacterium, there's crosstalk there with plant cells. It is possible that you could develop an inhibitor that would just inhibit the quorum sensing pathways of the bad bacteria, but that has not specifically been shown yet. Um, we, we don't even, I, in my opinion, we don't even have a really good understanding of who all the good bacteria are at this point to even begin to promise that specificity. But yes, you're absolutely right. That's, that's always a concern that if you are targeting bad bacteria, you may also be getting collateral damage to those good bacteria. Uh, uh, Dr. Danowitz, whenever you're talking about um, the different treatment methods and all that, is it possible to remove the plasma from the mutated uh, bacteria or cell and then use that as a possible treatment method? So you would be talking about finding all of the bacteria that contain the plasmid and then selectively just removing that plasmid? Yes. I have not heard of that um, as a strategy that someone has, has approached. My gut reaction is that that might be quite difficult to do, to find all of those bacteria that contain that plasmid and then specifically find a way to just remove that plasmid. You could envision something with gene modification with some of the new CRISPR type therapies, but I have, I have not heard of anybody specifically going that route. Other questions from the audience? So I have just one question left then for, uh, for the entire group that brings this into a more personal note. What role can and should individuals play in solving this problem? If we're looking at, for example, the people in this room. I think, you know, from my own personal perspective, teaching about tuberculosis and about infectious diseases is something that I can do. Um, and then encouraging you as students uh, to travel to the developing world, um, help out, um, help out with directly observed uh, treatment, help in setting up peer support groups for um, patients who have tuberculosis, and also even consider um, interning or working at the Global Fund uh, for Malaria, Tuberculosis, and HIV and AIDS, and in your future careers, probably also looking into research So the role of the individual personally has been mentioned by my colleagues, things like completing a dosage that when it's been prescribed to you, obviously not giving it away to someone else, uh, things like that are important. Uh, active role in terms of uh, as a consumer, right? So one of the problems we didn't touch on tonight really is antibiotics used in the production of food, uh, in the food chain and stuff. So when you shop, you can uh, favor farmers that don't use antibiotics as they're raising cattle and things like that. Um, you can vote, you can lobby uh, on these issues if you care about it. And I'll mention one, one person, uh, Patty Young. She was an airline flight attendant who uh, was an advocate for banning smoking on airplanes. She filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of flight attendants who had been subjected to years of secondhand smoke and had closed quarters in planes and stuff and suffered a variety of health consequences because of that. Uh, that was a really important win. Uh, in terms of not only uh, you know financial costs uh, to the people on the other side, but in terms of educating people and again helping write a, a new narrative. Yeah, I'd like to echo both of my colleagues in terms of getting involved, uh, going out and working with the public, educating the public, as well as the role of the consumer, especially with um, antibiotics in life livestock in the CAFO setting, that's a huge issue. I would also say just looking around the room and seeing all the science students out there, 
As you move on to become professionals, especially those of you going on into the medical field, really consider, should I be prescribing an antibiotic just because someone is asking for it? Additionally, as patients, keep in mind that if you have a viral infection, an antibiotic is probably not going to help you. So really understand or try to understand where your infection is coming from and don't ask for antibiotics unless it is truly something that is going to help the specific infection that you have. All right, I want to thank my, our panelists for this evening for their very informative presentations. And thank you all for coming and joining us this evening. If you are interested in other events from the Ethics Institute, please check out our page on the Mercy Christian website. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.